I've seen members of Congress stand up at conference meetings telling leadership that instead of wasting our time on a debate over legislative proposals, we should be out fundraising. Right now, members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70% of their time raising money. To receive a particular committee spot, you have to raise a certain amount of money for the party. First of all, it's totally unethical. It seems like it should be illegal. You know, they say they're trying to shrink government, but what they're really doing is just outsourcing it to contractors who then turn around and give political contributions. We have uh, over a trillion dollars in tax breaks per year in the tax code. There's no oversight on them. Do you know that we spend $50 billion a year on programs that don't even exist by law anymore. Most successful political movements in the course of our country's history have begun in the states. You know, it always seems weird to me when people refer to me as an activist. This is this incredible burgeoning movement on the rise. This is what we stand for. These are the policies that we seek to achieve. I think we have to recognize there's enormous potential to rally people from all political perspectives to the cause of reform. Because people on the left and the right both agree this system is deeply corrupted. On the program this morning, we're continuing. Last week, we got a chance to talk a little bit about uh, unrepresent. We are unrepresented, which is the new documentary film by Daniel Falconer. It includes a lot of good people, and there is a uh, the preview showing started yesterday. It's going on right now. I've got links up in the chat room if you'd like to go live stream that uh, for yourself, and you can go take a look at it. And then tomorrow night, starting at I believe 5 p.m. If I'm not mistaken is the uh, a panel. Uh, there's going to be a panel discussion, and on that panel discussion includes uh, Daniel Falconer uh, and, uh, and others uh, who are going to be discussing it, including uh, our next guest, which is David Walker. Now, David is, uh, you know, if you've listened to this program, you've probably heard of him before. I've mentioned him uh, several times over the last dozen years or so. He is the former Comptroller General of the United States and CEO of the uh, GOA, GAO, the Government Accounting Office. Uh, he's, uh, he's been working for years, both nationally and internationally, in fiscal responsibility and government transforma uh, transformation. He is, uh, serves as the Distinguished Visiting Professor and Crow Chair at the U.S. Naval Academy, where he teaches economics uh, of national security. And he is also the writer of a lot of books. He's a media commentator and uh, an all-around uh, an all-around uh, swell cat. I think is what we like to say around here. Uh, the Honorable David Walker joins us this morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, Michael. Good to be with you. And and very importantly, I've been to Alaska several times. Oh well, see there you go. Now you've got to mark that off. Notch your belt on that one right there. It's good to <laughs> good to right. have you back on the program. Now you and I spoke. You probably don't remember. Uh, but you and I spoke probably a dozen years ago, maybe 13 years ago. I had you on the program because at the time you had just uh, resigned, I think, as Comptroller General, and you were out there touting the the. And at the time, I think we were only about seven trillion, only seven trillion dollars in debt. Uh, but you were talking about the unfunded liability and how it was a, a definitely an exponential multiple of that. Uh, and so right. you you've been following these things for many many years as Comptroller, both in and out of public and private life. Uh, and now we've got this new film talking about We Are Unrepresented. Uh, I want to first talk about your gen How did you get involved with this project and what, you know, what was your part in it, aside from being on the panel and things like that? What, what was your, you know, did you, what did you have to do with this, uh, if anything, uh, the movie itself? Well, I was originally supposed to be filmed for the movie, but unfortunately we couldn't make uh, the schedules work for me to be able to do that. And the movie addresses something that uh, I've talked about for a number of years, and that is the fact that we now have a republic that arguably is not representative of nor responsive to the general public. Uh, and it's a combination of a flawed process uh, that ends up giving us the options that we have to vote on in general elections, as well as 
the power of big money. Uh, those are the two things that really have gotten us to where we are. And frankly, you know, when I did the 10 million a minute uh, national fiscal responsibility bus tour in 2012 and engaged with representative groups of Americans around the country, uh, we talked about not just fiscal reforms, but political reforms that were necessary to revitalize our democracy uh, to and to be able to make sure that Congress would be in a position to make some of the tough decisions that they need to make in order to create a better future. So I've been involved in these issues for a long time, was supposed to be in the film, didn't work out, but I am on the panel, and I do very much support the need for appropriate reforms. And you've talked about this several times. I mean, you've got a you've got a book that you put out back in 2010 that was talking about turning the country around and you know making us more fiscally responsible as a nation. Um, and I mean, that's been on your mind for at least the last couple decades, uh, because it is probably if there's one thing that's going to destroy the United States as a, as a sovereign nation, as a republic, it's not probably the enemies from without. It is the enemies from within, the people who cannot fiscally restrain themselves um, because I mean, we, we are a superpower. We've got the greatest army, navy, military force in the world, et cetera, et cetera. But it all turns on money. And if we can't get our spending in check, uh, we're going to destroy ourselves. Well, there's no question that, uh, in my mind, that America will will never be destroyed from the outside, but our biggest challenges are from within. Uh, And let's learn a little bit from history. I mean, as you may know, Michael, that my latest book is America in 2040, colon, still a superpower, question mark. And that's a legitimate question. Uh, You know, our, our future is in our own hands. But let's look back in history. The Roman Republic was the longest standing republic in the history of mankind, Uh, It fell. The empire then lasted for hundreds of additional years, but it fell for several reasons. And see if these sound familiar. Fiscal irresponsibility, political instability, moral decay, overextended military, and loss of control of its borders. Do those sound familiar? (laughs) Wait, Uh, wait a second. This is when? This is when? This is a few thousand? Is this this yesterday? Rome. (laughs) Rome. (laughs) The Roman Empire, you know, uh, one of the greatest empires in the history of mankind. You know, it takes four things to be a superpower in today's world. Global economic power, global diplomatic power, global military power, and following that comes global cultural influence. We're the only country that's met all four until recently. Soviet Union did not have global economic power. It did not have global cultural influence, although militarily and diplomatically it did. China is now reemerging. They passed us on uh, on uh, GDP based on purchasing power parity. They passed us on the number of diplomatic missions in the world. Uh, they're number two or number three, depending on how you want to count militarily or committed to passing this. And, you know, they're trying to do things to, to uh, in- expand their cultural influence, including Chinese investors on the largest movie chain in the United States called AMC Theaters, uh, which they're trying to use to their advantage. So, no, you know, we need to learn from history. We need to learn from others. We need to start making tough choices to make sure that we stay a superpower and that our future is better than our past. We and and we've been we we've been sounding and we being I mean you at the national level and me in my own hometown have been, you know, sounding the alarm about what's going on in America for years. And we see it, you know, we get politicians that get up there and they they pound the podium and they tell us, oh, yes, we've got these problems and I'm going to get to Washington and I'm going to fix it. And they get down there and within a year or so, they're squawking just like all the other chickens down there in Washington. They're, they, oh, well, we really can't cut. We couldn't do it, but we, we need to, but we can't. We keep raising our debt ceiling. We keep raising our borrowing limit. We keep spending money that we don't have to the point now to where our debt repayments – are getting to be so large that they're going to eclipse our military spending sometime in the near future. Uh, and and yet we just all act like this is all business as usual. And I just well, I, I just don't know yeah, what to do right. about it. Well, the Congressional Budget Office, which is the nonpartisan agency that does budget scoring for Congress, has said that the fastest growing expense for the next 10 years uh, will be interest. And what do we get for interest? Nothing. They've also said that it's very possible that we could be spending more on interest at the end of that 10-year period of time than national defense. Uh, you know, and, and what's really a problem is not just our past and, and present fiscal irresponsibility, but now you've got some crazy economists 
that have come up with this new theory, the modern monetary theory, which says that deficits and debt don't matter as long as you can uh, borrow in your own reserve currency and print money in order to be able to pay it off. Well, first, it's contrary to history, contrary to long-established economic theory. Fundamentally, uh, it's based on a flawed comparison to Japan. Uh, will cause inflation over time if you follow it. Uh, and, and quite frankly, it gives you know those who want to grow government and not worry about uh, you know our finances um, another excuse to just be able to spend as much as you can as fast as you can. Uh, because interest rates are temporarily low. Right. Uh, and now we saw a signal last month where inflation was a lot higher than people thought it was going to be. And once we get back to full employment, if we don't change our fiscal and monetary policies, we're going to have a real inflation problem. Right. Well, and to break down what you were just talking about, this new monetary, modern monetary policy, I mean, look, if we borrow money, and we do that in the form of floating bonds and things like that, but I mean, just to break it down into simple aspects, if I if if I want to loan you money, and you loan me a thousand dollars, but then I'm able to print money to devalue the 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 to to actually to reduce the value of the money that I have. So I'm actually going to go out and I'm going to print two hundred dollars or two hundred and fifty dollars worth of additional money. I will give you the thousand, but now it has an effective spending of twenty five percent less. Are you inclined to loan me more money in the future? I mean, that's essentially uh, what they're doing. Not if it's an arm's length transaction. You know who's buying most of the new U.S. debt? Who? The Federal Reserve. We are self-dealing in our own debt. Rates are not being determined by the market right now because most of most of the new debt's being purchased by the Federal Reserve. That's short-term gain, increased risk of long-term pain. Right. Because they've got to pay that back eventually, and they've got to pay it back. I mean, we're borrowing it from ourselves well, to pay back to ourselves, or is well, it? Well, we don't really have to pay it back. Here's the here's the key. What really matters is how much debt do we have as a percentage of the economy, and how much is interest as a percentage of the budget. Those are the two things that we need to worry about. Right now, debt as a percentage of the economy is an all time high. It's past the post-World War II level and going up, unlike at the end of World War II where we were going down. Uh, interest as a percentage of the budget is not at an all-time high, uh, despite the huge increase in debt, because we have artificially low interest rates. But they're not going to stay low over time. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, so, the, so the bottom line is, you know, we, we, we're, we're in a temporary situation. We need to recognize that reality. We need political reforms and we need policy reforms in order to be able to uh, put us in a better position for the future. David uh, Walker is our guest. He's a former Comptroller General of the U.S. and uh, executor of the uh, Government Accounting Office, also the author of several books. And he's going to be on the panel appearing tomorrow night for this film, We Are Unrepresented, which I want to get into some details of the film in the next segment. But I'd like to touch on one more thing here uh, before we go to a quick break, uh, David. And that is when I had you on the program before, um, we were talking about debt. But debt is not the true picture. Uh, just when people say, oh, we're $7 trillion, oh, we're $10 trillion, oh, we're $20 trillion in debt. That's not the true picture. You and I talked in the past about the unfunded liability and the true cost of the debt. And the numbers were so large the last time, I'm even afraid to ask you now, uh, because then I think the numbers ran into the hundreds of trillions of dollars. Now that we're at a, at a sizable, I think it was a $27 trillion debt now, uh, there are other factors rather than just that raw number that we are obligated to pay. Have you done the back of the napkin math on that now? Yeah, I have. If you look at the latest financial audited financial statements of the U.S. government, which are for the fiscal year ended uh, 2020, uh, you will find that uh, by the by the time you add up uh, the debt that we owe the public, the debt that we owe the trust funds, the unfunded pension and retiree health care obligations, the unfunded Social Security and Medicare obligations, uh, unfund you know unfunded environmental cleanup costs, et cetera. It's about a hundred trillion dollars. Uh, it's about a hundred trillion dollars. Now I can make the number bigger if you want, okay? Uh, but that ought to pretty much scare you. I mean, because l- let's compare that to what the economy is. The you know the economy is a little over twenty trillion dollars. You know, compare that to uh, you know what median household income is, what median net worth is. It's 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 multiple times uh, right. both of those numbers. And the, the the thing that's more important about it is it's growing 
much faster than the economy, uh, and uh, that's that's just uh, irresponsible. But we're talking about uh, we're talking about an unfunded liability and a, and, a, and a, I mean just an overall liability that is eclipsing the global GDP uh, by 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 a multiple factor. I mean that is that's huge, uh, and and nobody seems to be talking about it. Well, politicians don't like to make tough choices unless there's a crisis that gives them cover or unless you have committed and inspired leadership. And the truth is the biggest deficit this country has and has had for a while is a leadership deficit. Yeah. I mean, let's go back to China for a second. Uh, they got a plan. They have a long-range plan. And they're executing it. We don't even have a plan. Right. Our plan is to yeah, get we, to the next election cycle. That's our plan. Yeah. yeah. And where is that getting us? Right. Ex- Nowhere fast. Ex- exactly. We're losing ground. We're losing ground. I mean, you've been fighting this at multiple levels. I mean, it, you you've run for office, right? I mean, at one point, you've been you've been piping this pipe for a while. Uh, is anybody listening? I mean, is anybody you know, or as you say, is it just that the politicians don't want to make waves, and so they want to make everybody happy, so they just kind of kumbaya along? Well, first, when you have a pandemic uh, and a public health crisis. People aren't very receptive to, to uh, t- you know, talking about, well, what are we going to do to control deficits and debt, right? So right. what I'm hoping is going to happen is that now that we've turned the corner uh, and we're on the uptrend again, uh, that people will recognize that we did what we had to do, and frankly, in many cases, did a lot more than we should have done uh, with regard to the pandemic. But now we're in much worse shape than we were before the pandemic, and we were unsustainable before the pandemic. So I'm hoping that what will happen is that people will recognize uh, either as part of the debt ceiling debate, which expires, uh, you know, the suspension expires the end of July, or as part of the budget reconciliation process later this year, which is a must-pass bill, that will create some type of a fiscal sustainability commission that, unlike Simpson-Bowles, will actually actively engage the American people with the facts, the truth, the tough choices, listen to them, consider what they have to say, then make recommendations that will be guaranteed a vote in Congress. That's that's the kind of thing that we're going to need. We're going to need presidential leadership. Uh, without presidential leadership, you know, you, you're really not going to get to where you need to be. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm I'm disappointed right now as to where we are, but I, but but I can see a path forward, and hopefully, we'll take that path. You know, and this is not a problem of uh, this is not a problem of a specific party. It doesn't matter if you had an elephant on your lapel or a donkey on no. your lapel. Both sides have been basically on this runaway spending train to oblivion. It doesn't matter who you know who's been there; they've been contributing to the problem. I mean, from both sides. The last fiscally responsible president this country has had was Bill Clinton. And remember, Bill Clinton worked with Newt Gingrich, who was the Republican speaker, uh, and they made some tough choices. We had strong economic growth. Remember, Bill Clinton, in one of his State of Union addresses, said, the era of big government is over. Uh, Bill Clinton's still with us, uh, uh, you know, but the fact is, is that where we're headed right now is the exact opposite of what he talked about. Uh, you know, we've done a 180, uh, and that threatens the future of this country, and it threatens the future of our families. Well, and and yeah, you're right. I mean, he was the last president to pass a balance, a budget that actually balanced. Uh, and you could say a lot of bad things about Bill Clinton, but he did quite a few good things budgetarily to try and bring us back on track, which were immediately then blown off by all the subsequent presidents since. Well, the four, first four years that I was Comptroller General, we had budget surpluses. In two of those years, we paid down debt. In 2000, it was, you know, some projected that we were going to pay off all the national debt. I never believed that for a nanosecond, although, you know, we have been debt-free in 1835 and 1836. That's never happened again, okay? Right, right. And we don't need to be. We, and we don't need to be. But we've got to focus on debt to GDP and interest as a percentage of the budget. They're not focused on it now. We need to get focused on it soon. Right. Uh, Brett in the chat room says, I've read that interest and principal on our debt will soon eclipse our GDP. I think we're there, aren't we? Are we close to that? Uh, well, uh, well, the principal on the debt's already passed, uh, already passed GDP. Okay, I mean, uh, we're we're twenty eight trillion dollars in total debt held by the public and total debt that we owe to uh, Social Security, Medicare, and other trust funds, and and the GDP is uh, a little over twenty trillion. So we've already passed that. 
Well, and that's uh, that's that's the problem uh, when people don't understand all the ramifications of it. And many people don't because, I mean, many people have a hard time balancing their household budget. And when they look at all these words and spreadsheets and try and understand all the details of it, it becomes nearly uh, – uh, it becomes nearly impossible to try and figure it out, and people are, you know, they're confused uh, by it. And 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 I think politicians take advantage of that. David Walker is our guest, former Comptroller General. Uh, he's a professor and an author. Uh, he's going to be on the panel for We Are Unrepresented tomorrow night at 5 p.m. Talking about um, this film, We Are Unrepresented. And uh, what was your portion of that? You said that you were scheduled to be uh, filmed for the movie, but you're, you had scheduling conflicts and everything else. What was going to be the discussions for what you were talking about, David, okay. in the movie, uh, talking about what makes corruption legal in America? What 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 were you going to be discussing at that point? Well, I, I would be talking about two things. One, the power of big money, uh, the fact that a lot of money that is going into politics now at unprecedented rates uh, is dark money. You don't know who's giving it, uh, how much money it is. Uh, you know, in, in addition to that, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've got a situation where, uh, you know, you have uh, corporations and unions uh, who, uh, who can't vote. Uh, give a huge amount of money, as well as other special interest groups. Uh, a novel idea is, gee, you know, let's have people be able to give money to elect people, but maybe we ought to restrict it to people who actually can vote. Uh, that would be a novel concept. Uh, uh, you know, but the other thing that I would have talked about is the process. I mean, the process that we employ now by having uh, most states having closed party primaries, okay, uh, which and where, where 43 percent of, of national voters, registered voters, are unaffiliated, like myself, we're disenfranchised. We don't get vote to vote until the general election. That combined with redistricting, where most of the states are in, uh, you know, most of the districts are safe. That means you know it's going to be a Republican or a Democrat. You just don't know which one. Has resulted in a great partisan and ideological divide. Uh, there's very little overlap between Republicans and Democrats ideologically. There used to be. There used to be something called a conservative Democrat. There used to be something called a moderate Republican. There are very few of those now. There are some, you know, but there are very few uh, and getting fewer. Uh, and, and, and that combined with uh, having very close margins, we're tied in the Senate, we have the closest margin in the House in years, means that every election is about control, which means that you know, the, the minority party doesn't want to give the majority party any, you know, any victories. Uh, and we just keep on stalemating. It's one thing to stalemate when things are going well, but when things aren't going well and getting worse with the passage of time, it's not acceptable. So is this really more about breaking the two-party dichotomy than anything else? I mean, is that really, I mean, is that been one of the major contributing factors to what we're dealing with here is instead of having, you know, the the more choice of a third party or some other kind of independent group that, that and as I mentioned it earlier before, it it just doesn't seem like whether you had the donkey or the elephant on your, your lapel, whether what really mattered or if it mattered a, a whit. But is that really what it comes comes down to is, is challenging this two party system that we have right now? It's increasing competition, increasing choice and uh, dealing with uh, the huge and growing amount of dark money. The dark money. There are that, other things talked about. Yes. Dark, dark money. You know, look look at what happened in some of the most competitive races. Let's look at Maine for the Senate, uh, Georgia for the Senate. Most of the money that was spent on that race was not contributed by people who could vote in those respected races. And a lot of the money that was contributed to those races uh, was dark money. You don't know who you don't know who gave how much. And this again, this comes back to. I mean, we had a we had obviously had a a a, um, a ballot proposition that came up here that opened up the elections here in the state of Alaska. And the irony that I thought thought of it was that you know in their ad campaigns they talked about eliminating dark money, while basically benefiting from the same dark money because they were being funded by many groups from outside and weren't reporting <laughs> on everything. I mean, you know, it, it really has become kind of a quagmire of. Uh, kind of a quagmire of uh, of of understanding in this election process about who is supporting what and and who's behind uh, who's behind each one of these different candidates or initiatives. Well, that's right. Look, 
for any system to achieve sustainable success, including a political system, you have to have three things. You have to have properly designed incentives that encourage people to do the right thing and discourage them from doing the wrong thing. You need to have adequate transparency, including over money, and you need to have appropriate accountability. The truth is we fail that test in our political system. David Walker is our guest, former Comptroller General of the U.S. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up with him here. He needs to go. Uh, but I wanted to give you the chance to uh, to have the final say, David, to tell us uh, you know, your final thoughts on this. And what can we as citizens, just regular, average, everyday listeners and citizens out there, what can we do to help this? What can we do to slow the slow the bleeding, so to speak, on our national level, on the monies, on the politics, on everything else. So final final thoughts from you, David Walker. Be sure you watch the film. Uh, if you can, partici- you know, uh, participate or, or listen to the panel discussion that we're going to have, which is at 5 p.m. tomorrow, Alaska, Alaska time. Uh, hold your representatives accountable for what they do and what they fail to do. And recognize the reality the government's going to have to engage in major restructuring, so you need to focus on yourself, your family, uh, and make sure that you consider that in planning for the future. We should be doing that anyway, but it's always a good rule to uh, it's always a good rule to follow to make sure that we're paying close attention to what's going on. Uh, and as David has pointed out in some of the other questions that we've talked with him about, uh, I mean, now is the time to do it. There's not a whole lot of time left if we want to right this ship. I mean, right, David, this is like an aircraft carrier. It doesn't turn on a dime. It takes a while for it to get there, and we're going to have to start uh, pulling the rudder to the side right now to avoid uh, to avoid putting the whole thing on the rocks at the moment. The ship's taken on water, but we need to uh, don't give up the ship. Don't give up the ship. Uh, David Walker, former Comptroller General, professor, and uh, author of, uh, of a couple new books, including his latest one entitled America in 2040, Still a Superpower? Question mark, which uh, you could find uh, pretty much anywhere books are sold. Uh, online, da- online. Online. It's uh, all online. Amazon, yep. Amazon, Amazon. <laughs> Just go Barnes & Noble. There you go. By Amazon, Barnes & Noble, anywhere online. You should be able to find it. Just Google it, and we'll get you'll get it out there. America in 2040, Still a Superpower? Question mark. David Walker, thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming on board and talking with us, and I look forward to seeing you on the panel tomorrow night. Thank you, Michael. All the best. Bye-bye. Pre- appreciate it. Uh, appreciate you coming on board. Um, I mean, folks, this is the this is the time. This is where we need to be paying close attention. I mean, when he says we are with the unfunded liability well over well north of a hundred trillion dollars in uh, not just regular straight debt, but also the liabilities and the unfunded liabilities and the pension funds and the Social Security funds and the commitments and everything else. And we've only got a, 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 you know, and our our national GDP is only at $20 trillion. We're at five times that right now in liability. Oof. Just, I mean, again, put that towards your national, to your, uh, to your annual income and now figure out how are you going to dig yourself out if you are five times your national income in debt. That 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 is some spooky stuff. Spooky stuff right there. I hope you go out and watch this new film. It's again we are unrepresented. Uh you can just put that in in uh, on Facebook. You could say we are unrepresented. Uh the Alaska virtual screening is open and up right now. You can follow the links and you can uh you could see the film uh online right at this moment. They've got a Zoom and a Facebook Live panel going on, a discussion tomorrow night at 5 p.m., and uh, it'll be interesting to watch. Uh, we are unrep- unrepresented.com is the website, and you could take a look at it there and see all the things we're talking about. Um, David, uh, David Walker will be one of the panelists, Daniel Falconer, the director, uh, State Senator Bill Wilikowski will move there, uh, Julie Olson from Alaska Move to Amend will be there. And uh, it should be a very interesting discussion uh, for tomorrow, again, starting at 5 p.m. So hopefully you get a chance to, uh, to do it.